Welcome, everyone, to the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. I am your co-host, historian and guide, Eric Lindblade. And as always, I am joined by my co-host, historian and guide, Jim Hessler. Jim, we're embarking on new territory today. We've done a lot of two-part episodes. But this could be the first of a multiple-part series on one of the most important figures related to the Gettysburg campaign. So tell the listeners, what do we have coming up for them? Long Street. Now, every Gettysburg enthusiast knows that name. But who really was Lieutenant General James Longstreet? And which version of Longstreet do you prefer? Was he a defensive general? Was he the sulking betrayer of the early Gettysburg historiography? Or do you prefer the more modern version, an all-wise subordinate who simply could not get Robert E. Lee to listen to his plans? As you guys can imagine, there's going to be a lot to unpack here. So as Eric said, we're beginning a multi-part installment that we hope will take us up at least through July 2nd as we deep dive on one of my favorite generals in part one of Longstreet on the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. Jim, tell our listeners tonight about our sponsors. Yeah, so first of all, once again, we are coming to you live from Getty's Gear. As you know by now, Getty's Gear's retail location is located at 777 Baltimore Street in the old Gettysburg Village, across from the Tour Center. If you can't stop in to see them here in Gettysburg, you can also call them at 717-334-3747 or email info at gettysgear.com for expedient order processing. And as we've been saying for weeks now, their philosophy is simple. They produce high quality products, reasonable prices, exceptional customer service, all kinds of Gettysburg related gear. Getty's Gear, home of the Battle of Gettysburg podcast. Now, in addition to that, Eric, we also have a new sponsor. Our very special James Longstreet episode is sponsored by a new member of our family, TR Historical. Now, as you know, our mission is not to make history boring and stuffy. Well, guess what? That's their mission, too. So this is a perfect marriage, kind of like the marriage of James and Helen Longstreet. See what I did there? Well played. Well played. All right, now TR Historical is a family-owned small business from Easton, PA. You know, we love our small businesses, and they offer a one-stop shop for people who love history. Now, TR Historical does not limit their historical swag to only Civil War themes. This includes medieval history, the American Revolution, or as Longstreet might say, we whopped you British twice, arts and science, presidential history, both world wars, and, of course, Civil War items. Visit their website at trhistorical.com. And yes, that is TR as in Teddy Roosevelt. Look for Teddy in the logo. You can email them, support at trhistorical.com. They have free U.S. shipping. Worldwide shipping is available on request for all of our super fans in other countries. And speaking of super fans, you can save 10% with this code at checkout. Use the promo code SUPERFAN. And you can follow them on Facebook or on Twitter. And Eric, we've just told folks how to reach out to our newest sponsor, TR Historical. But how can they reach out to us? You can find us on social media, on Facebook at the Battle of Gettysburg Podcast, on Twitter at Gettysburg Pod on Instagram at the Battle of Gettysburg Podcast, or you can email us at gettysburgpodcast at gmail.com. Also, if you would like to help out the show, easiest way to do that is you can go to our PayPal page at paypal.me backslash Gettysburg Podcast if you'd like to give a one-time donation to the show. Also, you can go to our new Patreon page, which you can find us at www.patreon.com backslash Gettysburg Podcast, and you can give a recurring monthly donation. So we want to thank everybody who has helped out so far. It has been a tremendous help to what we have been doing and our mission to keep this show free of charge, which we think is one of the best resources on the Battle of Gettysburg out there so that we can keep that free for the masses. So I think now let's start to unpack James Longstreet. Yes, and uh, can we perhaps unpack with maybe some personal commentary and some disclaimers of our own? 
So first of all, Eric, I don't know about you, but I've always liked Longstreet. You know, I was introduced to him via the Killer Angels. Uh, actually, for many years, and some folks know this, I actually intended to write a Longstreet biography as a bookend to the Sickles biography. And at least as of now, ultimately, that has not come to pass. But Longstreet has remained a crucial player in, in all three of my books. However, I don't know how you feel about this, but over the years, I've kind of come to accept the possibility that Longstreet might not be the all-wise, all-knowing Tom Berenger that we saw on screen, which I think kind of needs to lead to another disclaimer, if I could. Um, you know, a reminder that we need to be balanced when we're dealing with our biographical subjects and balance can mean you know not too negative or not too positive and you and i have talked about this many times over our lives you know the historiography was once very negative against long street and you know really over the past well 47 years since the publication of the killer angels in 1974 yes folks 47 years the historiography has been, in fact, very prolonged street. I am pleased to announce tonight that Jubal Early is still dead. So, you know, people aren't really coming out to the battlefield today bashing Long Street and, you know, hoorah for the Sunrise Attack Order and all that stuff. But I think just sort of a little bit of a disclaimer here. What I think Eric and I are going to try to do is not necessarily rescue Long Street, but we just want to try to, in our own unique way, try to deep dive and get to the heart of who was this man? Yeah, my sense is Long Street today does not need saving. Uh, there are still people out there that are crusading to save Longstreet. I just don't see the need today. Now, I think what's very interesting, if we look at works that have been done on Longstreet, you know, we're talking about one of the more important figures of the American Civil War, and yeah. there really has not been a tremendous amount of literature really done on Longstreet compared to, say, Jackson. Um, how many biographies of Stonewall Jackson do we have out there? How many of Longstreet do we really have? One of the interesting quotes that I was doing in my prep was from William Garrett Piston's Lee's Tarnished Lieutenant, James Longstreet and his place in Southern history, which is not really a biography as much as it is a sort of delving into Longstreet in popular Southern memory. And he ends his book with, I think, a very interesting quote. Now, this book was published in 1987. So let's think about what's going on here in the 80s. We're just into the 125th events. We've not had the movie come out. It's still kind of an interesting period. So he's going to write, James Longstreet's negative image is not likely to change. His role in Southern culture has been that of villain, not hero. And cultural roles cannot be overturned by scholarship. The most laudatory biography imaginable could not give Longstreet anything to compare with the hundred years of adoration accorded Lee and Jackson. He's going to end by saying, as long as Southern history remains something that is lived and felt as much as read, Longstreet will be remembered primarily as Lee's tarnished lieutenant. William Garrett Piston's Lee's tarnished lieutenant is a must-have read for anybody who is even remotely interested in the topic. You know, I refer to Piston as basically the dean of modern Longstreetology. I don't know if Longstreetology is a word, but we're just going to dub we that. create it. We just created that. Longstreetology really, in my opinion, starts with William Garrett Piston. Can't speak highly enough. Love, love, love his stuff. But I think that I don't know that that closing quote would hold true anymore. Right. And that's yeah, why I wanted to kind of yeah. lead with it. Because right. like, people would hear that, they go, wait a minute, that's not the Longstreet we know. That's not the long street well, we think of. Well, well, you know, that's the million dollar question. I mean, you and I as guides, you know, and other colleagues maybe have similar experiences, right? We take people around the battlefield and what you primarily get, first of all, if you assume anybody on the tour has heard of long street. What you primarily get, which obviously all good Gettysburg people know Longstreet, but what you primarily get is this notion of, oh yeah, Longstreet, Lee should have listened to him. Show me which way did Longstreet want to go around to the right and all of that stuff. You know, as I said in my intro, nobody is going, oh, that SOB, you know, he didn't attack at sunrise. I mean, maybe in 20 years I've had like two people say that, you know, kind of thing. So the, the, the perception of Longstreet among mo modern Civil War people, and I'll say again, folks, 
47 years since the Killer Angels was published, the modern perception is, I believe, almost overwhelmingly positive. Yeah. And I think, too, notice, you know, we talked about Piston's book. Yeah. 1987, it's published. Yeah. You know, the Killer Angels has been out, but I think it's really the movie that really is that moment where the shift happens. And I think what we do is it's not only the movie, but I think the movie caused people to either reread the Killer Angels or read it for the first time, which, of course, it gives a very sympathetic view. Of Longstreet. Yeah, and, but, and you know, and you talk though about the historiography, okay, the first 100 years or whatever it might have been was, was anti Longstreet, you know, but the last 50 in which volume of literature has exceeded anything that came before it is again almost unanimously pro Longstreet, whether it's a Longstreet biography or, you know, Jeff Word. Like, I know people who call Jeff Word a Longstreet critic. I'm like, are you? Gonna- yeah, please laugh. I'm like, are you kidding? That's like, it's like the most pro Longstreet biography you could ask yeah. for. Um, but whether it's a Longstreet biography or what, you know, Corey Farr has done recently mm-hmm. with Longstreet at Gettysburg or just general campaign studies, you know, you can critique certain aspects of Longstreet's behavior or you can critique certain aspects of his performance and not be a long street critic it's called being a historian and trying to get to the truth of the matter and i know that's what you and i always strive to do i think the last 50 years i can't speak for deep in the heart of the south because i'm not from the deep south but you know the last five decades have been pro long street you know i growing up in north carolina never heard any strong anti long street sentiment i mean obviously he would lag behind probably in popularity of Lee right. and Jackson and maybe even Stewart, right. but that was not an, a, an indictment of his personality. I think, you know, now granted I was not growing up in the South and say 1890. Right. Um, right. But uh, you know, there, there's, I think a, a shift there. I think if anything, Longstreet has a very favorable view now yeah. in, in the South overall. The I mean, South, I've, yeah. I've not had one tour that I can think of here. Where someone has said, you know, that Longstreet guy, right? He really, you know, he really screwed things up here. Yeah, I haven't had that. In times I've I've lectured on the Battle of Gettysburg, right. I've not had a strong Longstreet yeah, sentiment. Me neither. You know, at least negatively in that sentiment. He is a figure that probably has shifted the most. I think sometimes when people look at the way he was viewed at the turn of the century, the way we might have viewed Longstreet, even in the sixties, I think we have to give Glenn Tucker some. Oh yeah, some yep, respect, yep. you know, some some credit stop, for that as well. Stop, Glenn Tucker. Glenn Tucker. Okay, please continue. Glenn <laughs> Tucker. Once again, Glenn. You know where Tucker. we're going with this, folks. So yeah, I think Tucker helps sort of put Longstreet back in a proper context. Mm-hmm. So it has been a process, but I think yeah. you know, a lot of people would probably be shocked by you know what was said in say, 1987 by Piston. There. Yeah, that's yeah. not the Longstreet of our mind today. So I think it. We want to go into this to humanize Longstreet. Right. We're not here to deify him. We're not here to crucify him. Right. We're here to humanize him. And I think if people have followed kind of what we have done in the last three seasons with some of these more controversial figures, I like to think we have handled them with quite a bit of objectivity, as well as, I think, showing them as human beings, not the caricatures people often make. Yeah, yeah. Sickles report, notwithstanding, and the jokes we make about Sickles, you know, our actual historical treatment of him is, is always been objective unbiased and i would challenge anybody who thinks i'm not objective on sickles to go actually read my published work but you know while you were talking something just sort of popped into my head and it wasn't something i thought of in the pre-prep notes you know you talk about long street's image in the south and that sort of thing what did you always hear you always heard well long street doesn't have any statues in the south he doesn't have any monuments in the south and of course in the late 1990s Longstreet got a, like the man, a very polarizing and controversial, but a statue nevertheless put on the Gettysburg battlefield. Think about this now is other statues and monuments are being removed throughout the South at the time of this recording. Longstreet, ironically, might end up being one of the last ones standing. So think about that to chew on, folks. And again, talking about how things do change over time. So I think now let's turn our attention to James Longstreet, the man. And Longstreet's story begins on January 8th, 1821, in the Edgefield District of South Carolina. He's the fifth child and the third son of James Longstreet 
and Mary Ann Dent Longstreet. Interestingly enough, Longstreet's family does not tie directly back to South Carolina. His father's family actually has connections to the state of New Jersey. His mother's family actually has connections to the state of Maryland. So kind of an interesting background. When we think of a lot of our Confederate generals, we think of, you know, first family of Virginia, or they've been in the South as long as it's been the South. Longstreet's family, I think, is a little different. They're also in a more rural some would even say backcountry region mm-hmm. of South Carolina at this time. So I think this is kind of something to look at as we look at Longstreet's development is sort of the the sense of place that he was raised in. Yeah, and although there's that famous line in the film, my people were Dutch, which, you know, going way, way back to the ancestors were, but we're not going to go that far back. I always find it ironic that, you know, he should have said, I'm from Jersey, you know, kind of thing. And that probably wouldn't, that probably would have got a laugh in the theater and a shout out to Superfan Madden and all of our other Jersey listeners. Yeah, you know, one thing real quick um, that we should just touch on too is the aforementioned William Garrett Piston, you know, has noted that Longstreet biographies really tend to provide only a sketchy account mm-hmm. of these early years. And really, with the exception of Jeff Wirt's biography, most of them really skip right to the military stuff, in large part because everything Longstreet wrote later was focused around either attacking or defending his war record and because also a lot of Longstreet's personal papers were destroyed in an 1889 fire. So, you know, you don't really get a lot of this childhood background of his and that sort of thing. But, you know, what we do know is around 1830 at the age of nine, his parents sent him to Augusta, Georgia to live with his uncle and receive an education, his quote-unquote uncle being a noted lawyer, judge, editor, publisher, and humorist by the name of Augustus Longstreet. Now, Augustus would really, I think, have more of an influence on Longstreet's life than his own parents would. In his memoirs, he says his father died when Longstreet was at the age of 12 of cholera. I've seen other accounts where, you know, that age might differ a little bit, but clearly Longstreet's father dies at an early age. And what we really see is Uncle Augustus really being that father figure for Longstreet and raising him on the kind of the Georgia plantation and that sort of thing, which is really going to begin the Georgia affiliation that Longstreet's going to carry throughout his entire life. And it's an interesting point you made that Longstreet does not write a lot about his childhood and not trying to read too much into it. But I could imagine as a nine-year-old, you're being sent to live with your uncle. Yeah, I think that's, it may not be a period of, of a lot of happiness for Longstreet, Maybe. possibly. But I think what is interesting, his father, probably his father's greatest contribution to Longstreet, is the nickname that we all know Longstreet <laughs> by today. Please don't. Are we going we, there? We have to. Because you know what? No, we're taking it back. We should make a rule. That if the nickname is used in the movie, you should know the actual historical background <laughs> and context where that nickname comes from. Just don't call him Old Gloomy Pete or Old Pete. Yeah, just all right. Because of all that. right, I'm going to plug my ears here because this nick. When people refer to him by this nickname on social media, for some reason, it's like nails on a chalkboard to me. So I'm I'm putting my hands over my ears. Just go for it, Eric, and tell me when you're done with this segment. According to family tradition. James Longstreet's father was impressed by his son's character, his rock-like character on on their farm, giving him the nickname Peter. Of course, obviously, the biblical connotations there. And he was known as Pete or Old Pete for the rest of his life. Now, there you go. Now you know the rest of the story. But please, folks, stop using the Gettysburg movie names for these people. Or at least know the context and background. Well, I'm going to get off my soapbox. Well, what I kind of feel like is, and I know, I know, Old Pete is a nickname that a lot of his friends, his military friends, his army friends use throughout the rest of his life. But there's just something about, you know, when when we reach out to these historical figures by their nicknames, I don't know. It just feels too familiar with me. Maybe I'm being old school. Maybe I'm becoming stuffy and old. But I just, oh no, no, no. I just think Longstreet has cooler nicknames than Old Pete, and certainly as you said old gloomy pete come on guys yeah. let's let's find some cooler nicknames and maybe we'll dub a few by the time we're done with i this. mean he got the nickname the bull of the woods exactly that's way cooler than pete lee's war horse yeah you know, all of that is a lot cool hell i would even go with staff in my right hand before i'd go with old pete but that's just me anyways all right folks so we've addressed old pete right off the bat 
Do we got more on his plantation years? I mean, obviously, he's a big kid. Uh, he loves the outdoors, you know, as we'll see when he gets to West Point. He's, you know, like a lot of these guys, maybe more of a kind of an outdoorsman than a student kind of thing. But, you know, he grows up. He's exposed to this plantation life. He is exposed to his well-educated uncle, which I think is important, you know, to kind of help shape these formative years. And as we've said, he's going to kind of develop this attachment to the state of Georgia, but that's not where he's going to get appointed to when he receives his West Point appointment. Yeah, I think what we see during this time, and I, I would say there's no doubt that Augustus Longstreet is probably the, the biggest influence on James mm -hmm. Longstreet's life. There's yeah. no other way around it. And, and really, in researching Augustus, Talk about an incredibly fascinating guy. Yeah, no kidding, right? right? Yeah. Um, I think what's interesting is that we see a lot of things that we would associate with Longstreet as coming from Augustus. Um, Augustus, by all accounts, had an absolutely impeccable intellect on any number of issues. Should note that he was actually, though, a very fierce states' rights advocate. Yeah, he beginning was. Beginning during the nullification crisis. And we did have a question asked about you know, Longstreet's kind of political views. Mm -hmm. And okay. I think Longstreet, maybe we don't really know where he comes down on some of these issues. We have some hints, but I think he's at least exposed to this. He's at least thinking about this. In my opinion, I think Longstreet's not really as apt to discuss his political views, right. which, gee, what a wonderful concept. <laughs> uh, but I think what we see is that Augustus, you know, well, instills in Longstreet a lot of these traits that we're going to see develop throughout his life. Well, he will. And, um, you know, although I made the joke about his father originally being from Jersey, um, there's no doubt during at least these years and up through secession that Longstreet considers himself a Southerner. I mean, if nothing else, that's kind of what forms in Longstreet's persona, so to speak. And, you know, it's one of the reasons why he'll, he'll resign his commission when, you know, the late unpleasantness um, later gets started. So we should we maybe take Longstreet here up to West Point at this point? Yeah. Um, you know, as I said, um, his dad dies somewhere around when Longstreet is around 12 years old, give or take. Um, you know, we don't see much of Longstreet's father in the standard story, but his mother then moves to Alabama. And his West Point application is apparently made through what is often described as a kinsman by the uh, name of Congressman Reuben Chapman. And I always kind of laugh anytime I see the word kinsman, because I think what that means is, well, he's related, but we really can't figure out what the relation is. So we just kind of throw the word kinsman out there. So maybe that could be another theme of season three. Kinsman. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. I like that. Yeah. yeah. All right. We don't know where you we don't know how you should be at our family reunion, but we know you need to be at exactly. the you'll, you'll be at the kinsman table because yeah. we really haven't figured this out. Um, so again, Longstreet's an outdoorsman as a young boy, a military career, and no doubt the education appealed to young Longstreet, and he received an appointment to West Point from Alabama. He was generally, as we all know, probably a poor student where he graduated in the class of 1842, ranked ultimately 54th out of uh, 56 cadets. Now, Let's pause there for a minute, because I think it's fascinating, too, to just kind of look at some of the classmates uh, that are with him in the class of 1842, see how some of them ranked in comparison to Longstreet. And then, you know, we can kind of uh, discuss how that ultimately does or does not parlay into future success on a battlefield. Number one in the class of 1842. I'll pause while people think of it. Number one, Henry Lawrence Eustis. A shining light in American military history. A history. monumental figure. Um, actually, I've barely ever heard of the guy. Uh, but number two is a guy that I do know, uh, and for super fan Paul out there, John Newton. Hey. John Newton is number two. Uh, William Rosecrans, number five. John Pope, number 17. Seth Williams, 23. Abner Doubleday, 24. And, you know, Doubleday has historically not been considered the smartest or the brightest bulb out there. Remember, his nickname was actually Stupidity. Uh, well, he was 24 and Longstreet was 54. I'm just saying. Daniel Harvey Hill, 28. Tardy George Sykes, 39. Richard H. Anderson, 40. And an important figure in the Longstreet stories, Lafayette McClaws, 48. 
all of these guys fil- finished well above future Lieutenant General Longstreet in the class of 42. Once again, I think, goes to show, at least in those days, that West Point education, it's given you a good education, it's given you training, but as we see time and time again, class ranking doesn't translate into future battlefield success. In some cases, not at all. Jeffrey Wirt, in his biography, described Longstreet during this time as neither a model student Mm -hmm. nor a gentleman, which, let's not take that as to say that Longstreet was not gentlemanly or a a good person, but he was kind of a little rough around the edges. And I think also his education that he received, a lot of it was driven by Augustus. Yeah. This would not probably classify as a standard classroom type education so i think what we see with longstreet is he's a great thinker he has a wide breadth of of knowledge to pull from but as far as in a classroom dynamic it might not be the place to excel we see is once he gets beyond that he will certainly excel in his life well you know and he talks about in his own memoirs from manassas to appomattox he talks about having more interest in horsemanship sword exercises and football than academics. You know, you talk about the great thinker thing, and he says he actually failed mechanics because he could not understand the concept of a pulley. So, you know, hey, look, 20, 21 years old, I don't know how well I would have done in mechanics either. So we're not we're not casting any aspersions on Longstreet. We're just giving you a little bit of background into how, you know, what he was like at that age and, and how he developed. And, you know, again, In our first edition of the Dan Sickles report, again, I'm just drawn to the Sickles parallels. You know, people always say, oh, my God, he was not West Point trained, you know, and things of that nature. Well, okay, but once again, West Point of that era doesn't seem to really translate to the battlefield. It just doesn't. No, and I think you're hard pressed to find a Civil War figure of any note that really you could say West Point is where they learned everything they were going to be as a general. It's what defined them. I mean, certainly, you know, Robert E. Lee, second in his class, you know, translating to Lee's future career. Well, okay, but no offense, superfan Paul, John Newton, you know, although a very capable guy, you know, was no Robert E. Lee. So, or George McClellan, where McClellan ended up in his class. So to me, West Point of that era really feels more like a crapshoot. What it does is it gives you the opportunity to serve. And then what you do yeah. during this service, I think these men are a lot more shaped by their experiences in Mexico, on the frontier, yep. and in the pre-war army than really they are anything they would have ever learned at West Point. But that's the gateway to get to that point. And I think Longstreet's a prime example of that. Yeah. Now, the other thing we should talk about, too, that was important in the West Point years was the relationships that he formed. And obviously, two that are critical during that period would be other cadets, including, you know, Ulysses Sam Grant. And I think probably just as important future and support at Lafayette McClaws. Um, Now, I know we had a question or two about the Longstreet-Grant relationship, and we'll come to some of that. It seems indisputable that Longstreet and Grant had close ties, you know, together in the U.S. Army in the early years. But they were enrolled at West Point at least over an overlapping three years there with Longstreet, again, graduating in 42 and Grant graduating in 43. I think a lot of the relationship really forms later, you know, when they get into some of the frontier service. But again, I do want to just sort of point out, while Grant is going to be of interest to broader historians for a Gettysburg-themed podcast, uh, his early relationship with McClaws is more noteworthy, especially, again, given how quickly after Gettysburg those positive feelings are going to turn, you know, kind of upside down. So to me, it's always been interesting and noteworthy to note that at this early age, Longstreet and McClaws, you know, were classmates, friends, and, you know, later are going to serve together. Yeah, and I think that's a good segue to sort of look at Longstreet as he leaves yeah. West Point. Uh, he's going to be commissioned a second lieutenant. He's eventually going to be assigned to the 4th United States Infantry at Jefferson Barracks, Missouri. He's going to spend the first two years of his service there. And of course, soon after this, he's going to be joined by his West Point friend, Grant. During this period as well, in 1844, it's when Longstreet is going to meet his first wife, mm-hmm. Maria Garland, who was the daughter of Longstreet's Post commander. As this is going on, and during the period where Longstreet is courting Garland, 
Grant is going to become acquainted with Longstreet's fourth cousin. A kinswoman. A kinswoman. A kinswoman. Julia Dent. And of course, as we know, they're eventually going to get married, which then leads to one of the most common things you will hear in relation to the Longstreet-Grant relationship. People say that Longstreet was Grant's best man. Well, maybe, maybe not. There's a lot of really contradictory research on this. Some will state that he is there, but his role is uncertain. Others will say that he may have been a groomsman. Yeah. It's interesting to note that neither Grant nor Longstreet note the role of the other in their memoirs. You're right. So, yeah. Yeah. And you're right. The, you know, the National Park Service, at the, one, the Grant site, has is, is actually done some interesting research on this. It appears the first recorded claim of Longstreet is the best man dates back to Moxley Sorrell's 1905 memoirs. Now, Sorrell, you know, who's served many, many years on Longstreet's staff, was not at the wedding, so he's just repeating this many years later. But as Eric alluded to, Longstreet, Grant, or Julia, none of them ever described Longstreet as being either a best man or a groomsman. I do think Longstreet and Louise were at the wedding, but I don't think he would. You know, I, th- I think the historical evidence would actually probably suggest him as the best man or him as a groomsman is probably more myth than reality. Brought up his first wife, Louise, um, who I think deserves maybe a little more attention than she gets in the historiography. Again, if nothing else, just for the influence, you know, that she has on, on Longstreet the soldier. Now, as Eric mentioned, she was the um, daughter of an army officer, John Garland, who would later rise to colonel and a brevet. It, Brigadier General. But I think as an army brat, you know, to use the modern terminology, as an army brat, Longstreet had matched himself with a woman who really understood the life of a soldier. You know, so they're literally going from assignment to assignment. She's going to bear him ultimately as many as 10 children. But I think having a, you know, an army brat as a wife was good for Longstreet, his career, as well as a stable home life. But by most accounts, she was, you know, what has been described as a raven haired beauty. Lieutenant Richard Ewell, who we have seen on previous installments of the podcast, described Louise and her sister as the only attractive girls in the entire state of Missouri. Wow. Which is high praise indeed. Do we have listeners in Missouri? You know, I should point out that that is Ewell saying that and certainly not a modern reflection. That is not us. You're right. That was a quote from Lieutenant Richard Ewell. And, you know, it's interesting, though, despite all of this, again, Longstreet doesn't tell us much about Louise in his own memoirs, which is kind of a shame. But by all accounts, it was a happy union. You know, as I said, they produced 10 children, five of whom are going to survive to adulthood, which is kind of a sad and noteworthy story in its own right, which I imagine we'll come to here at some point. We should note the last name Garland. By this marriage, Longstreet now becomes related to Samuel Garland who we've talked about in the Iverson episode, and who will actually be a regimental commander in Longstreet's 1st Brigade in 1861. So kind of a neat little connection there with with Garland, um, who I think, you know, he's kind of an interesting figure to me. I I like studying Garland. I think kind of these connections we see with these commanders. We often talk about D.H. Hill and Stonewall Jackson. Well, we have kind of uh, an example of this as well with uh, Long Street and Garland. That stuff always reminds me too what a small world it was back in those days. Everyone was a kinsman of someone else, it seemed. The only thing that's really missing here is, you know, that he was somehow related to Ben Butler. Because, you know, everybody seems like they were related to Ben Butler. You know what? If he's not, can we just say they're kinsmen? Kinsmen of Ben Butler? Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Sixth cousin type yeah. of thing. You know yeah. what? I think I want to make, you know what? Maybe we should make a t shirt. I'm a kinsman of Ben <laughs> Butler. Yeah, I like it. I like it. You know? Yeah. It, yeah. It's fun for the whole family yeah okay so now do we need to take this up another level we have our super fans maybe now our super kinsman levels for the, for the patreon subscribers or maybe, something maybe, you can be yeah. a super kinsman yeah okay. you know if you if you donate to our patreon we'll let you be a kinsman to whatever civil war figure you would like how about that <laughs> that works a kinsman to dan sickles who wouldn't want to who be wouldn't want to be sickles as kinsman okay so i'm going to take it to 1850 as eric kind of alluded to long street seems to be getting some benefit from his father-in-law colonel at least in terms of assignments Uh, not necessarily promotions but you know some good assignments including getting named chief of commissary in san antonio which by the way happens to be one of my favorite cities in america that point in his life 
Longstreet doesn't like the desk bound jobs, so he saw to transfer to cavalry, although that didn't happen. It again goes to show that Longstreet at that point in his life, you know, kind of wants to be in action. He wants to be out in the field. He doesn't want to be behind a desk. Again, that'd be the kind of thing that would be overlooked probably in most biographies, but it does give Longstreet administrative experience in feeding large bodies of men. Which, as we know, an army marches on its stomach. This, in my opinion, is not an insignificant skill for young Longstreet to have. And before this, you know, it had to be a tough transition because he is incredibly active in the Mexican War. He sees a lot of yeah. action. He's all over the place. Exactly. But I think a lot of that has been covered into a lot of detail. I, I think what we see is that he's had experience as a combat officer. He's also now, though, moving into the areas of what it takes to really be a good commander. Right, right. And also what he's going to see, he was part of Zachary Taylor's arm. Right, right. Taylor becomes a model for a lot of these figures on how to conduct campaigns, how to maneuver these troops. So he's having these examples, but yeah, it has to be tough. Early in your career, you're you're rough and tumble, you're in the action, and now you're sitting at a desk. Mm -hmm. That can't be easy. Yeah, but right. Longstreet's going to learn important skills that I think are going to serve him well. And I think what we also see is these lessons, but we might be getting ahead of ourselves. I've always felt Longstreet maybe has the best staff of any general in the Civil War. I think that is something that you learn by doing. And he's taking these roles that staff have to have. He's learning how important it is, and he's going to look for that later down the road. Yeah, I would agree with you. You know, in our free-flowing conversation here, you're right. We did kind of gloss over Mexico a little bit. But um, again, there's other places where you can get his Mexican War information. But, you know, he's wounded at Chapultepec. He fought skillfully alongside George Pickett. You know, so again, that's sort of another early. Do we, do we tell the George Pickett story about the little skinny tree? And as the tree <laughs> goes this way, the men went that Back way. and forth kind yeah. of thing. You know, we really need Stephen Lang here, I think to give that story justice. And Longstreet did receive a, um, a brevet promotion to major for his gallantry in Mexico. He was wounded. And again, it's another thing that he pretty much glosses over in his own memoirs, uh, but it is his first real combat experience. So yeah, you know, yeah, I think you combine the Mexican War of the 1840s, his administrative experience that he's getting in the early 1850s, and I think we got the makings of a pretty well-rounded guy here coming into focus. Good family life, you you know, the wife who understands what it's like to be in the army. I mean, Longstreet of the early 1850s has got a lot going for him, but promotions are still going to be slow in that pre-war frontier army. And as uh, Louise, you know, is churning out more kids, obviously a guy like Longstreet, and you see this reflected in some of his correspondence, you know, he needs money to support his family and to, to educate his family. So he's got to increasingly, like many of us do when we start having families, he's got to start looking for that as a consideration in his, uh, in his future assignments. Okay, so we said, you know, Longstreet didn't seem to be real happy behind a desk in San Antonio. 1851, he's going to resign his commissary post. He's going to go return to the 8th U.S. Infantry. His service for the next three years has been described as scouting duties along the frontier. So, you know, again, maybe this ties back to later when he, you know, utilizes guys like Harrison. You know, the, he appreciates the scouting aspect of it. I don't know. I don't think we're reading too much into or that. Or the, the personal experience mm -hmm. doing it. I mean, as yep. a commander, you're having to reconnoiter a position. Yep. He's yep. done this. So yep. Yep. another thing to kind of keep in the back of your mind. Exactly. Kind of like another thing he's adding to the resume. He's going to be finally be promoted to captain from December of 1852. Uh, but while temporarily in D.C. during the summer of 1854, his son William is going to die, tragically, of, uh, of illness, uh, which unfortunately is not going to be the last time the long streets are are going to have to do deal with that. 1855, he's going to temporarily command Fort Bliss. So again, now he gets post-commanding experience uh, for a brief stint. Lieutenant George Pickett was also there. So again, you got their paths crossing. 1858, promoted to major and transferred to the pay department. And he's actually going to continue and be a paymaster when the Civil War began. So as I said before, you know, Longstreet had declined, kind of had shied away from staff positions when he was younger. He was He's now approaching 38 years old. He's got a growing family. And he told his uncle he would now live anywhere as long as he could save enough money to educate his sons. 
He had hoped to get an assignment in Philadelphia. Boy, there's got to be a first. Somebody who wants to live in Philly. Wow. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Super fan Maria. I'm kidding. Hey, you know, people have already said we disparage the good name of Carlisle. So <laughs> ah, we're well. starting to alienate a lot of the Commonwealth. My, my son lives in Philly. If that helps you folks, I give it a rest. So, all right. But instead, he's going to be assigned to Fort Leavenworth in Kansas Territory, then to New Mexico. So, again, we're literally hopscotching all over the country here. And as a paymaster, you know, his basic duties are to ride from post to post and pay the man, which Eric will now bring us up to the eve of the American Civil War. So we're now at the eve of the Civil War. Longstreet has had a solid career in the United States Army. Some might even say somewhat distinguished, but nothing that's really going to make him stand out in the crowd. But what we see now is Longstreet being pulled by a lot of the same issues that are pulling a lot of other Southerners at this point. I think what's interesting with Longstreet, I always feel he becomes, in some respects, he develops into a Southerner. He's just not born into it. So he has the influence of his uncle, Augustus. Certainly these political issues that are going to play out in the late 1850s, early 1860s, they're probably in his mind. But what we see is that Longstreet is going to cast his lot with the South. Now, there is some questions over sort of the circumstances that he leaves. There's, I think, you know, depending on who you read in their research, eh, there's some questions on that. But needless to say, Longstreet will leave his service in the United States Army and will cast his lot with the Confederacy. From what we can tell, he didn't really embrace secession, but he felt his primary allegiance to the South and his people were Southerns. You know, there's no real surprise there, I think, when it comes. He initially offered his services to Alabama, which, as we said before, was where he received his West Point appointment uh, and where his mother lived. But his payroll duties kept him into the U.S. Army into April. So there's some indication that he had considered resigning earlier, but the paymaster department kind of said, hey, we need you to do this and this. And Longstreet felt obligated to stay. So he actually stayed in the U.S. Army, I think, probably a couple of months longer than he, or at least weeks anyways, longer than he really planned on to, but he wanted to close down his his, his paymaster duties. There is some, like we said, there is some debate kind of around how and when he resigned and, and, and received his appointment. Uh, Jeff Wirt goes into this in his Longstreet biography. And, um, you know, if you guys want to kind of look at that for a little more detail. Um, but what we know is basically he seems to have been appointed an infantry lieutenant colonel from Alabama in March of 61. You know, he accepted it in early May and then wrote his uh, resignation letter a few days later. But when Longstreet then finally does travel across country to join the, uh, the Confederate service, goes instead to Richmond. And he met with Confederate President Jefferson Davis June 22, 1861, where he was informed that he had been appointed a brigadier general with the date of rank from June 17th, which he then accepted a few days later. So right off the bat, June of 1861, Longstreet has got himself a brigadier general appointment in the uh, fledgling Confederate Army. We should note Longstreet really does not write a lot about this period right. himself. Uh, in his memoirs, he is going to call it a sad day when he leaves the army. He's going to talk about some of his comrades from the North, kind of persuaded him not to go. And he's going to state that when he was asked what course he would pursue if his state should pass ordinances of secession and call him to its defense, he confessed that in his words, he would obey the call. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. That's where we are. I think you know, we would not say he is a rabid partisan by any accounts, but I think he is behaving very much as a typical Southerner. What we also see with Longstreet is that there is a sense of ambition with him. I think it's interesting. You know, he could have cast his lot with South Carolina. He could mm -hmm. have cast his lot with Georgia. But he chooses Alabama, and so that's kind of weird. He never really lives in Alabama. His mom's there. But one of the things I found interesting is if he leaves the Army, when he goes into the Confederate Army, he is the ranking West Point cadet in seniority from the state of Alabama. It's not yeah. going to hurt you in rank-wise. So yeah. I think Longstreet is a guy that is very much attuned to his position in the Army. He's not kind of selfless, put his head down, 
guy that we always make him out to be. He's ambitious, and there's nothing wrong no, with that. No, there isn't. We should probably pause there for a minute, because a lot of people in today's society hear ambition is a dirty word. Mm-hmm. And like you said, somebody out there is going to be going, oh, my God, I can't believe you said this about him. Look, he's got a lot of mouths to feed at home, like everyone, like you, me, like everybody listening to this podcast. We are interested in advancing our own careers to the greater extent possible. Longstreet was by that point in his life, as we've said, a fairly well-rounded and well-experienced army officer. Nothing wrong with going for where he thinks he's going to get the highest rank. He is by far not the only person doing that or attempting to do that in the spring or summer of 1861. So now we're leading up to the first action Longstreet's going to see in the American Civil War, which is the first Manassas campaign. Mm -hmm. And he is going to have command of a Virginia brigade. First, the 11th and 17th Virginia, some units you might hear of here at Gettysburg. So this is already this connection that Longstreet's going to have with some of these kind of foundation units that's going to be part of his core for really the rest of the war. Yeah, and so he's going to report to Brigadier General P.T. Beauregard. Maybe our first Beauregard reference on the Mm -hmm. show? I don't even know anymore. We've recorded so many of these, I can't remember anymore. You mean Pierre Gustave Toutain Beauregard? Yes, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, They're going to report at Manassas, but Longstreet's Brigade is going to see their first real action at Blackburn's Ford on July 18th. The battle is going to really proceed First Bull Run or First Manassas, whichever you prefer. And at Manassas, the brigade is going to play a relatively minor role, although it's going to endure some artillery fire. Later in the afternoon, though, Longstreet received an order from Joe Johnston, who is going to be a guy who also plays a fairly large part in Longstreet's life and career. But Longstreet received an order from Johnston instructing him to uh, take part in the pursuit of the defeated and broken federal troops. Longstreet obeyed, but then he received other orders basically telling him not to and to to retreat. And according to Longstreet's staffer, Moxley Sorrell, Longstreet flew into, quote, a fine rage. He dashed dashed his hat furiously to the ground, stamped, and bitter words escaped him to kind of get these conflicting orders and to pass up what Longstreet apparently felt was a great opportunity to to pursue and break up a defeated opponent. So again, we see a little bit now of Longstreet getting a little fiery on the battlefield, which I'm kind of liking. And really, it's hard to take away a lot of performances that we see in this campaign. I never do. It's, I think... It's well, kind of like West Point. What we do see with Longstreet, I think he performs very well at Blackburn's Ford. He mm-hmm. manages his forces very well there. Although, I don't want to say an insignificant battle, but certainly compared to what he's later going to be doing in the war, a, a smaller action. Like we said at, at Manassas, he's not heavily engaged. But I think it's interesting. We do see this aggressive streak in Longstreet, wanting to push the matter forward. You know, this idea that Longstreet's Mm defensive-minded. Well, he can be as hard-hitting as the rest of them, which we get into a little bit later. Yeah, let's come to that as it develops. But I think he leaves this campaign. He certainly gave a very favorable impression to Beauregard. He gives a very favorable impression to Joe Johnston, which is something that I think Longstreet does really well outside of his time with Braxton Bragg. He has a tendency to really impress his superior officers. And that's something that I think is not a bad thing, as we're going to see that he does very well under Beauregard, he does very well under Joe Johnson, he does very well under Lee. Yeah, and I would argue this Longstreet-Johnston relationship, if you look at some of the things Longstreet says and writes later, I would argue that Longstreet could probably be more attached personally and professionally to Johnston than he is to Robert E. Lee. Now, we're not going to do the Lee-Longstreet relationship here. We want to save that for another time. But again, the the Longstreet-Johnston relationship is one that often gets overlooked by you know a lot of Gettysburg scholars, because Johnston isn't at Gettysburg, of course. But I think it is important into kind of understanding Longstreet the man. Uh, Likewise, yeah, I never really put a lot into the first Manassas campaign. It's kind of just everybody learning on the fly, but it's always kind of interesting um, to see who does what. And Longstreet must be impressing people already because by October, he's promoted to major general and given command of a division in the newly reorganized and renamed Army of Northern Virginia under the aforementioned Joe Johnston. 
So I think the biggest takeaway, solid performance. I think we can start to see some potential there for Longstreet. And I think others see that potential because he's going to become very soon already a high ranking officer in a matter of months. So think about, you know, October, he gets his division command. Ten months before, he's a paymaster in the United States Army. I think sometimes people forget the massive leap these guys make at times. And I think Mm -hmm. what we see is that Longstreet handles it pretty well. Yeah. Overall. And, you know, I'm going to fast forward a little bit just to December of 1861, but there's a lengthy account. Staff Officer Thomas T.J. Gorey, he writes to his mother in December of 61. There's some passages in here that are often used by historians, but there's some other passages sometimes that get glossed over. But I think taken as a whole, it's about as good of a first-person description of Longstreet that we have at this point. So I'm just going to read. It's a long letter. I'm I'm just going to read some parts of it. Gorey tells his mother that Longstreet is a very fine officer, as brave as Julius Caesar. His forte as an officer consists in the seeming ease in which he can handle and arrange large number of troops. In an action, if he is ever excited, he has a way of concealing it, and he always appears as if he has the utmost confidence in his own ability to command and then out of the troops to execute. Okay, so right in that first paragraph, we've learned he's brave, he can manage large bodies of troops, and he can do it confidently. All seems pretty good to me. In a fight, he is a man of very few words and keeps at all times his own counsels. He is very reserved and distant towards his men and very strict, but they all like him. Gorey then goes on to a physical description. Longstreet's about 5'11 and about 200 pounds. I mean, we always sort of think Longstreet is like 6'2 and all that stuff. 5'11, 200 pounds is kind of, I'll use the term generously, stocky. And while that really is really here nor there, it does lead to the observation that when on foot and in citizen's dress, he has a rather sluggish appearance. And I think that's noteworthy because, you know, later the critics are going to say he's sluggish and just sort of seemed like a slow guy. And I think it's possible there might be something in the appearance that would contribute to that. Although, again, Gorey adds he is exceedingly punctual and industrious. Whatever he has to do, he does it well and quickly. And then he goes on to talk about how handsome the ladies find Longstreet and how agreeable Longstreet is to the ladies' attention, which is kind of cool. You know, not something you always think about with Longstreet. All right, another personal observation. At home with his staff, Longstreet is, quote, some days very sociable and agreeable. Then again, for a few days, he will confine himself to his room or his tent without having much to say to anyone and is grim as you please. When this is the case, he's either not well or something has not gone to suit him. When anything has gone wrong, he does not say much, but merely looks grim. We all know how to take him, and we do not talk to him without finding out whether he is in a talkative mood. He has a good deal of the roughness of the old soldier about him. Again, the letter goes on. I'm going to stop there, and I will just want to highlight that last passage. You know, he can be sociable, he can be agreeable, he can be very grim when things go against him, because again, you know, the Longstreet critic will kind of take that passage out of context and say, see, he's he's sulking when things don't go his way. And folks, the letter doesn't say that. The letter just says, you know, when things don't go his way, we try to stay away from him. And I think that would probably de- describe pretty much all of us. Oh, and I should add, too, in the same letter, yes, you'll be happy to know all of the old army officers like to call him Pete. Oh, sigh. There so really, as 1861 turns into 1862, it really seems everything is going according to plan or exceeding expectations for James Longstreet. But very early in 1862, he's going to suffer probably the most profound loss of his life. What we're going to begin to see is this is when the sickness of his children begins to take root, often described as being a scarlet fever with an outbreak that was going on in Richmond. And as we'll see during this time, these outbreaks can be incredibly deadly and really sparing no family. The way it could just sweep through a family, and unfortunately, the Longstreet families are going to become examples of this. 
Yeah, you're right. It's um, it's a sad and often told story related to Longstreet and his subsequent character. But yeah, as Eric said, a scarlet fever outbreak is going to strike Richmond in January of 62. Four of Longstreet's children are going to be struck by it. And uh, unfortunately, three of them are going to die. Now, obviously, Longstreet raced to Richmond as soon as, you know, he was informed of this. Unfortunately, um, his one-year-old daughter, Mary Ann, died on January 25th. Uh, his four-year-old son, James, died on the following day. And then 11-year-old Augustus, or Gus as they called him, died uh, on February 1st. Only his 13-year-old son, Garland, who remained ill for quite a while, eventually recovered. Now, this is a sad story. You know, it's often repeated that George Pickett basically handled the funeral arrangements, uh, like many of sort of the Pickett legend type of stories. There's some doubt being cast upon that. Again, like many things, there's really no contemporary evidence, at least at this point that I'm aware of, that has shown up to indicate that George and his uh, future wife, LaSalle, arranged the funeral or the burial. The only source we really have for that is an account written by LaSalle herself to Longstreet's second wife, Helen, in January of 1904. And given how dubious many of Sally Pickett's other accounts are, you really got to take that with a grain of salt. So you often see it repeated, Pickett made the funeral arrangements, eh, possibly not true. Yeah, and I've often wondered with a lot of Sally Pickett's writings, these stories tend to morph. It wouldn't shock me if the pickets were not with the family sure, giving them comfort right, being around. I mean, Longstreet right, has that connection right. with George by all accounts, a very close relationship, but does that being around morph over time? Oh yeah, we yeah. did the funeral. And, and it's interesting to note that for unknown reasons, neither Longstreet nor his wife attend the funeral. Yeah. That's of the children. Her. So who really knows what is going on in this time? I can only imagine how overwhelmed they would have had to be yeah. just as people. Yeah. Uh, so now, the lasting legacy of this right. is that there is going to be a change in Longstreet's character. You know, there are accounts in 1861 that his headquarters was actually a, a pretty fun place to be. There's parties, there's drinking, there's card games going on. After that, I think he becomes much more somber, much mm -hmm. more serious-minded. It doesn't mean that he has completely withdrawn, which I think sometimes people make that assumption that right. he completely withdraws. I don't see that, but I think he certainly changes his his attitude and outlook on a lot of things, which obviously a trauma like that will do that. Yeah. And, you know, regardless of who buried the, the Longstreet children, you, you know, it has nothing to do really with the outcome of the Battle of Gettysburg. It is a touching human interest story that too often is repeated as, you know, kind of an unchallenged fact sort of thing. It does speak, though, to the Longstreet picket relationship, which, you know, you, again, you can argue later on when you get to Gettysburg that some of Pickett's role as a division commander, you know, again, is helped by the Longstreet friendship. But yeah, Longstreet, you know, being the dedicated professional that he is, does return to the Army camp very quickly. Quickly after this, by early February, Longstreet is back in the camp, and Gorey, the staff officer, wrote again on February 9th, tell, writing to his mother, quote, Just think of it, three children within one week. The general is very low-spirited. He has only one child left. So, you know, to the point, I mean, obviously Longstreet was low-spirited for quite some time, I'm sure, but he also seems to throw himself into his work, into the war effort. And, you know, as we get into 1862 and the Army of Northern Virginia transfers from Johnston to Lee, as we said before, Longstreet is going to catch the attention, the eye, and the confidence of the newly promoted Robert E. Lee. So the death of his children obviously impacts him personally, but it doesn't hinder what he's got to do on the battlefield or running the, his portion of the army. So I think this is a good point to sort of start up the spring campaign in 1862. Longstreet is going to see action in what is called the, the Peninsula Campaign as McClellan is moving up this first on to Richmond push. We're also going to see him performing in the seven days as well. And and it's sort of a mixed bag that we're going to see. Really, there's no way to look at Longstreet's performance, the Battle of Seven Pines, and really a positive outlook. But then again, you're hard-pressed to find any Confederate commander that performs really well at Seven right. Pines. So, so we'll give him a bit of a pass there. But what we will see is really the biggest takeaway from Seven Pines 
is, of course, going to be the serious wounding of Joseph Johnston. In his place is going to be Robert E. Lee. What we will see is that really Lee relies heavily on Longstreet in the seven days. And we had a listener question of what is the moment where Longstreet really kind of comes to be viewed by Lee as, you know, my most trusted subordinate, my old war horse. I think if you look at the evidence, a lot of it seems to be beginning in the seven days. Yeah. That Longstreet showed himself to be dependable capable and can handle these assignments, which is something that Lee was looking and really was lacking in a lot of other officers during that campaign. Yeah, I, I agree with the influence of uh, of the seven days, you know, as I think we probably touched on in the Jackson episode. Jackson, for example, you know, has some very questionable moments during the seven days. So, yeah, any aspersions directed against Longstreet at Seven Pines, as we said, you could spread it around within the army, but uh, Jackson's own performance comes under scrutiny. And I think this too also helps shine that spotlight upon Longstreet. When did that moment happen? Well, it's during the seven days that Lee reportedly starts referring to Longstreet as the staff in my right hand. Again, that's during the seven days and, and probably when when he starts really coming to Lee's, Lee's notice, as he should. One other thing, though, that's always been interesting to me about Longstreet during the seven days is then the feud that kind of touches off between Longstreet and A.P. Hill. So again, if you're looking for Gettysburg connections, which is what we do, obviously you kind of might want to take a look at this idea of how the Longstreet Hill relationship develops from 62 through 63 and whether it does or does not hinder their performance at Gettysburg. But it starts during the seven days or after, I should say. Longstreet and his staff become mad that partisan news accounts seem to give Virginian division commander A.P. Hill much of the credit during the campaign. So Longstreet then apparently submitted an article to the papers, which then angered A.P. Hill. So Hill then requested to be moved out from under Longstreet and for a while refused to respond to orders. So then Longstreet ordered Hill to be put under arrest. Hill then challenged Longstreet to a duel which finally Lee intervened and moved Hill under Jackson. And that worked out for everybody. Exactly. Oh, Eric, these irascibles in the Army of Northern Virginia, here they go again, you know, just challenging your commanding officer to a duel when you don't like the way things are going. And an interesting takeaway on this, Longstreet fighting battles in the press exactly. and through the pen. And we can even begin to see this a little bit. We kind of talked about his performance at Seven Pines, in his report, he, in my opinion, kind of unfairly throws Benjamin Huget under the bus yep. here. These are things that we're going to see in Longstreet's life later. And and so this is nothing, you know, we talk about the controversy with Jubal early after the war. He's already doing this stuff during the war itself. Yeah, those are all good points, Eric. And, you know, I know some of the Longstreet people are not going to like to hear that, but it's true. I mean, when you look at Longstreet's career and things don't go well for him, he's not shy about calling out subordinates. And I'll kind of say that about as charitably as I can. And this is not us saying this. These are Longstreet's words. Right. These are his own writings here. And, and I think this goes back to the idea of you can still like somebody and not like everything they do. You know, they don't have to be perfect all the time. And I think, I, unfortunately, with some of these figures we see during the war that have these followings like Longstreet mm -hmm. does, anything that deviates from something in a positive light. You really, become a critic. You become yeah, labeled as a critic. Yeah, which I think is, which is just the reality. He's a human being. Which is which is kind of silly. Uh, yeah, the thing, too, that I want to, before we go too far away from it, too, with the Longstreet and A.P. Hill thing. So, yeah, you have, you know, you have for a while now Hill is going to be moved out from under Longstreet. But, you know, there are going to be at times when we get to Gettysburg accusations that they may not have cooperated as well together as they could have. And I do want to point out, just before we get away from it, that Moxley Sorrell did later believe that all the hard feelings were smoothed over. And I just want to call that out before somebody says, no, Jim, by, Longs, by Gettysburg, they were getting along fine. Well, Sorrell said they were getting along fine. But I think, you know, there's some, there's some times you could challenge it. So I just want to call that out there. I think it's an interesting sidebar to the Gettysburg drama, the whole Longstreet Hill relationship. So as we leave the peninsula in the seven days, 
Longstreet looks pretty solid. Mm-hmm. He has earned, I think, the accolades of his new commander, Robert E. Lee, which I think is interesting that Lee takes to Longstreet very quickly. But Longstreet, I think, still has some doubts about Lee. And yeah. And this now, this comes from Longstreet's memoirs, which I always say, take those memoirs with a grain of salt. But what Longstreet's going to note is that he initially doubted Lee's mm-hmm. ability for command. Yeah, he did. Um, keep in mind, he's very close to Joseph Johnson, the guy that Lee is replacing. He's going to write that Lee's arrival was far from reconciling the troops to the loss of our beloved chief, Joseph Johnston. He's later going to write that Lee did not have much of a reputation at the time that he took command. Therefore, in Longstreet's words, and I'm using his air quotes here, misgivings about Lee's power and skill for field service. So while maybe Lee has a a good view of Longstreet, I don't know if we can necessarily say at this point Longstreet has the same for Lee. It's a still a learning curve for these individuals, I believe. Yeah, no doubt. And Longstreet's going to continue to be corresponding with Joe Johnston and at times saying things like, boy, would love to have you back um, and things of that nature. So you're right. The, you know, as you said, the Longstreet Johnston relationship is not one that should be easily dismissed. Now, Longstreet, though, does admit, again, going back to the memoirs, which I agree, you got to take them all with a grain of salt, does, though, admit, though, that the relationship and the bond starts to grow as we start to move into the second Manassas campaign. And Longstreet wrote that the relations of confidence and esteem, official and personal, ripened into stronger ties. Longstreet wrote that Lee always invited me to give my views in moves of strategy and general policy, not so much for the purpose of having Lee's own views approved and confirmed, but is to get new light or channels for new thought. So now you have this notion of Lee taking Longstreet into his confidence and basically soliciting views from him. And again, I know a lot of the old school Virginia Confederate Southern historians would basically Basically go bananas at these types of assertions. What do you mean the great Robert E. Lee taking advice from Longstreet? I tend to believe that it's accurate. I tend to believe that Lee is a commander in recognizing Longstreet's abilities was indeed, you know, solicitous of his opinion. At the end of the day, though, folks, it's the army and you got to do what the commanding general wants. But, you know, I think if nothing else, it does speak to the growing bond between the guys, despite those original misgivings, which were definitely there and really for lee at this point in his army who of high rank can lee rely on longstreet has put the performance Mm -hmm. in and i think what this does it starts to shape the relationship that longstreet and lee are going to have and what lee looks at is coming out of the seven days he's not necessarily seen a multitude of talent in high command think about guys like gustavus smith we're not going to hear much from him anymore. Mm-hmm. You know, John Magruder, he's gone. So I think Lee is in very much a a figuring out what is the leadership of this army going to be. And Longstreet provides a very steady, capable hand, which I could see why during this time Lee begins to rely on him more and more. Yeah, we would be remiss if we did not add Jackson to that. But, you know, Jackson at times often feels more independent. And what observers are going to increasingly be calling upon, too, is how much time Lee spends with Longstreet. You know, Lee is often found near Longstreet's headquarters. Lee often rides with Longstreet and things of that nature, which is going to lead us up into one of the most pivotal moments of the pre-Gettysburg Lee-Longstreet relationship, and that's the return to Manassas. Battle of Second Manassas in the campaign in the summer of 1862. So by August, the armies are starting to concentrate around the old Manassas battlefield. Again, we're not going to deep dive on this, but we got to give you some context. Uh, scattered federal forces in Northern Virginia are going to be organized into the Army of Virginia under the command of General John Pope, who arrives with a reputation from the Western Theater. Now, by August 27th, Jackson had seized Pope's supply depot at Manassas Junction, and Jackson moved into a position in the woods at Groveton near the old battlefield. Pope headed towards Manassas, basically to bag Jackson. And at the same time, Lee is going to be moving northward with Longstreet's Corps to reunite the army. So on the afternoon of August 28th, Jackson is going to attack 
a Union column as it marched past on the turnpike, which is going to lead to the fight at Bronner's Farm. Okay, that's just a little bit of the background. Now, here's where Longstreet comes in. Years later, Longstreet's critics accused him of being slow to arrive at Manassas, forcing Jackson to fight it out on his own for the better part of two days. But Longstreet's troops seem to have marched about 30 miles in 24 hours on the 27th, and Lee was present and seemed to be fine with the pace. So, you know, this criticism that Longstreet was slow at Manassas, I think, doesn't hold water. But it's kind of then what comes after that that likewise is going to leave him open to uh, to criticism. So Lee will be with Longstreet again when they march through a very hot day on the 28th and into the morning of the 29th. And on the morning of August 29th, Longstreet is going to conduct a recon and then deploy infantry and artillery in a position against the federal flank. So now you have the makings here of Jackson being on the defense, Longstreet on the offense. By midday, everyone, including Lee, was anxious to attack, but Longstreet wanted a more thorough recon done, which Lee approved. Longstreet saw that the Federals occupied half of his front and reported so to a fairly disappointed Lee, but then a courier from Stewart indicating that the Federals were also along the Gainesville-Manassas Road in considerable numbers, threatening the Army's right flank, also came in, so Lee basically relents from making an attack. All right, so I'm going to pause there for a minute because I know I've been doing this for talking for a while. But what do you have here? You got the makings now of Lee being anxious to attack and Longstreet really counseling for more recon, more preparation, and basically wanting more time. Where have we heard that story before? Exactly, right? This sounds very familiar. And I think what we'll say of Longstreet, you know, he does get that reputation times being sluggish or slow. Frankly, covering 30 miles in 24 hours, that is not slow. <laughs> we, that, that's moving. We consider it legendary here at Gettysburg with the Sixth Corps, right? Yeah, absolutely. Right? So I think what Longstreet also is aware of, though, is that moving at that pace comes at a cost. These guys are going to be worn out. The animals are going to be worn out. So having that extra time, one, giving your men time to kind of rebuild their strength a little bit, but also understand they might not be as effective as they would have been. Having better reconnaissance, better intelligence is only going to offset that, make it a little bit easier for you. So I think what we see with Longstreet is he's very meticulous when it comes to setting up an attack. But once he gets going, it's very hard to stop him. And I think a lot of that you would say, well, gee, is it because he's so hard-hitting? I would argue it's because he puts in the legwork and the preparation to lead to a successful attack rather than just rushing into it, and it falls apart, which how many times do we see that during the Civil War? Yeah, and so that's going to come on August 30th. For August 29th, we're going to continue to do recon, and finally by about 5 o'clock, Longstreet appears to basically talk Lee out of attacking. And so I think we had a listener question around this. And again, others, other historians, Douglas Southall Freeman, you know, has that famous quote where he says something like at Second Manassas, Longstreet learned that, you know, he could force his will upon General Lee. The seeds of much of the disaster at Gettysburg were sown in that instant. Exactly. This idea that, you know, Lee wants to attack, but Longstreet can supposedly kind of say, no, not until I'm ready. So finally, on August 30th, Longstreet is going to seize his opportunity. And with Federals attacking Jackson's position, Confederate artillery, some of which Longstreet placed, enfiladed the Union lines. And with Federal lines in disarray, Longstreet is going to finally order a counterattack with his whole line of about 25,000 men that has been described as like a giant hammer blow. I'm going to pause. Nickname, James the Hammer Longstreet. Like Greg the Hammer Valentine? Exactly. It just hit me, right? Forget about old Pete. You guys can call him old Pete and all gloomy Pete. Henceforth on this show, he is going to be known as James the Hammer Longstreet. Are we good with that? I'm good with it. All right. A giant hammer blow led by Hood. Again, it should be noted again, Lee is accompanying Longstreet during pretty much all of this. And it's been described as one of the best 
counterattacks of the war stymied in part because ultimately Jackson wasn't really able to cooperate. So Longstreet, the so-called defensive general, Second Manassas is a perfect pre-Gettysburg example of how, as we said, Longstreet can recon, prepare his troops, move large bodies of men, and strike them like a hammer. But on the negative side of it, you have this idea now that basically maybe he can, again, I'm making air quotes, kind of force his will upon General Lee. And what we also see is Longstreet's also very much aware of picking the right point to make the attack. Mm -hmm. And I think we see that in the controversy of the 29th, there's, I believe, a letter that Fitz John Porter's going to write to Longstreet after the war that says, yeah. had you attacked that day, yeah. you were going to be in rough shape. Right. And so I think it's a matter of picking that right time. And what we see with Longstreet is so often we view these individuals, we view them as, you know, influenced by Napoleonic warfare and the campaigns of Napoleon. One of the things I think is taken away is that Napoleonic warfare is less a matter of sort of these rules you follow but a mindset of looking at war in terms of finding the right opportunities to launch your attack. What gives you the most momentum? Mm -hmm. Also being able to kind of, for lack of a better term, kind of scramble if need be to find the right moment. And I think Longstreet is good at that. Yeah. Um, And I think Second Manassas is a great example. I think we also look at some of his attacks in the seven days. We're not looking at a guy that is defensive minded first. He's Mm -hmm. going to look at the situation in front of him and I think make the call, but he's not, I hate when people say he's a defensive minded right. general first right. because he's he's not folks. Right. He can do he can do either and he can do either well. There are post Gettysburg examples of Longstreet on the offense, but I'm intentionally trying to stay pre Gettysburg in this conversation just cuz again leading up to July 2nd. And yeah, one of the things that made the August 30th assault so successful was again this question of timing. The Union position, the Union troops in front of him at that time were in disarray and he saw the opportunity to strike. Now, unfortunately, you know, you're not always going to get the best opportunity on a battlefield. And let's compare and contrast when we compare August 30th at Manassas, second Manassas. To July 2nd at Gettysburg, you're not going to get a Union line in disarray at Gettysburg. And that's going to make a difference. But at least as far as August 30th is concerned, hits him at the right time, hammer blow on the federal flank. Lee is with him. Lee doesn't seem to object. And at least in this case, the results would show that it's 2nd Manassas. Longstreet's judgment proved correct. With the Army of Northern Virginia's success... Robert E. Lee is now going to push his forces north, which now leads us to the 1862 Maryland campaign, which I think we have some some good accounts of Longstreet in this. These are certainly some iconic moments for Longstreet in the campaign. And I think it also gives us a sense of his character and the way Lee begins to view him. Really, in my mind, Longstreet comes of age in the seven days. He really puts forward what he can do at Second Manassas, and I think the Maryland campaign, and then later into what he does at Fredericksburg is only going to further solidify this in Lee's mind. Yeah, I would agree. Certainly the move into Maryland continues this developing Lee-Longstreet uh, relationship. I don't know that there's a lot that we need to go into for our intents and purposes today. You know, Battery Longstreet, just in the afternoon of September 17th, when the battle took a critical turn for Lee's army, uh, Longstreet saw the Union attackers were advancing. He summoned every piece of artillery that he could get to take up a position on the Piper Farm. And after some of the cannoneers themselves were out of action, Longstreet's staff members actually began working the pieces themselves. And what I see, you know, when I think of that and why it's important to me is because what I feel like I see a lot through Longstreet's career is his ability to use artillery, you know, which not everyone has. You know, some people just think, oh, he's an infantry and a foot foot soldier. But I see, you know, I see these examples time and time again of Longstreet effectively using artillery to either complement an attack or a defense. So I think, you know, from from that point of view, the the action on the Piper Farm is interesting to me, at least, as, as we look at Longstreet as a well-rounded uh, kind of soldier. Of course, he's got a wound. So he's wearing the carpet slipper. 
Yeah, what a what an image on his horse, his carpet silver smoking the cigar. Yeah. And, you know, you know, I like to think Dan Sickles would have just said cut the limb off, but you know, Longstreet puts a slipper on. That's great. Hey, you know what? To each their own. Good we're not you. we're not criticizing. We're not, judging. we're not judging. We're not judging fashion tastes or or anything like that. Of course, at the end of the bloodiest day. He goes to meet with Lee, and Lee has the famous quote, Ah, here is Longstreet, here is my old war horse. So, you know, that famous quote comes out of the uh, Antietam, the Maryland campaign, which is great. But now that we're calling him James the Hammer Longstreet, eh, I don't even care about the old war horse anymore. No, no, it's nice, but maybe he used that in a previous territory. In the Gettysburg Territory, he's the hammer. He's the hammer from here, from here forward. Pretty much in the aftermath of the Maryland campaign, again, demonstrates Demonstrating Longstreet's capable performance, Lee reorganizes the army into those two corps under Longstreet and Jackson. And as probably many of us know, both officers are going to receive promotion to lieutenant general. Longstreet's dated a day earlier officially made him senior to Jackson, which is important to understand how Lee thought of it. And let's look at these two generals. And we covered a lot of this in our what if Jackson was at Gettysburg episode. But really, let's not look at the total job these commanders did. Let's look at what Lee saw directly. Really, Longstreet's record in 1862 under Lee's direction looks a lot better than Stonewall Jackson's. That's not taking anything away from Jackson. But I think that Lee is looking at these individuals. Where do they fit in the army hierarchy? I think he gives that edge to Longstreet, clearly because Longstreet gets the promotion a day earlier. So Longstreet is the senior commander in the Army of Northern Virginia. Yeah, no argument there. All right, so should we move into Fredericksburg? Yeah, let's get him up to Fredericksburg. All right, so now we're up to Fredericksburg. December of 1862. Again, probably as many of us know, Longstreet's First Corps will play a decisive role in that battle. Now, again, a little bit of background, not too much, but a little bit. Since Lee and Longstreet had moved to Fredericksburg early, it allowed Longstreet time. There again is the time, the time to prepare, the time to dig in portions of his line, sight artillery, and set up, you know, what has basically been described as a perfect kill zone over the Union's potential advance. Longstreet had trenches, field works constructed south of the town along a stone wall at the foot of Marie's Heights. So here we are. Longstreet's on the field early. He's got time to prepare this perfect position and it's going to help too though that frankly the yankees are going to kind of oblige him by repeatedly attacking the position now here's artillery again right he effectively employs his artillery as a multiplier and covers the field so well that porter alexander has that memorable quote that you know a chicken could not live on that field when we open it because of this When the Federals attack, you're going to have Longstreet using his infantry and his artillery to successfully repulse repeated assaults made by the Union forces against the strong position. Now, I always kind of wondered, why does the Union keep making repeated assaults? So again, you got to help to have cooperation from your opponent, and Longstreet gets that at Fredericksburg. At Fredericksburg, I think we can look at the success that Longstreet has on his front and contrast that with some of the issues that Jackson has on his front. Now, Longstreet had a lot more time to develop this, to put it into position, but you know, these are some takeaways we can take from this battle. And this is the moment at Fredericksburg where I think a lot of people begin to see the shift of Longstreet to maybe becoming more defensive-minded yeah. first. I always hesitate for that because sure. even though Fredericksburg is a great victory, what does Lee really gain from it? Mm-hmm. He, he can't use it to change the dynamic in the campaign against Burnside and the Army of the Potomac. They retreat across the Rappahannock and they're sort of there, Lee's stuck. So I think that, yes, in some cases, a decisive defensive battle is possible, but it really, you can be sometimes limited in what your options are after. 
Yeah, and part of this comes from Longstreet's own writings afterwards, where he will say, and this we'll talk about this more when we do the pre-planning for Gettysburg, but Longstreet says in his own writings to the effect of, you know, the example of Fredericksburg now showed me that by this point in the war, you know, it would be hopeless to assume the offensive and, and things of that nature. But again, you know, here's an example where, you know, you can lean so much in Longstreet's favor, you know, and he's been dubbed, you know, the most modern general in the Confederacy because of moments like this. You know, it shows, look, it shows great preparation. It shows an understanding of what he had and how to manipulate the terrain to his advantage. Uh, but yeah, I kind of bristle when I kind of hear, you know, the, the defensive general who by this point in the war only wanted to fight defensive battles because, you know, you're just not going to get that on every battlefield. But for Fredericksburg, hey, great job, Longstreet, no doubt. And the reality is is that ultimately, on a 19th century battlefield, defensive tactics alone will not win you the war. That's just the reality. So I think, yes, you can use a combination Mm defense-offense, kind of what Lee does at Second Manassas, yeah, to where you can use this initial defense to draw your opponent in and then deliver the counter strike, which is very much a Napoleonic tactic. Napoleon made a living of doing that in, in his time in command, but... I think in the end, there are some limitations from strictly being on the defensive. And I think Longstreet had to have understood that. He's a smart guy. Yeah, he's a smart guy. I'm sure he did. And I was going to touch on more of that when we did the Gettysburg pre-planning. But, you know, since we're kind of talking about it now, you know, think of it like a prevent defense in sports. I mean, you can go into the shell, you can go into the prevent defense, but eventually your opponent is going to overwhelm you if that is all you do. So what you really need by this point in the war is, yes, you can fight when necessary tactically on the defense, but you're still going to need to maneuver and you're still going to need to find those moments where you can counterattack. You can't you can't do it all on the defense. So as we see when we get into 1863, an idea that somebody like General Lee might propose or agree to only fight a defensive battle, it's just not practical. Yeah, I think that is we'll see that bear out in 1863 for sure. Yeah. But again, I'm impressed at Fredericksburg as I was impressed at the prior battles by how Longstreet combines infantry and artillery together. I've always been impressed by Longstreet's use of artillery, and Fredericksburg is the perfect example of it, but I would argue not the only example of it on his resume. And another solid campaign performance by James Longstreet. Yep. You know, we talked about Jackson being at times very up and down. I think what you get with Longstreet is a very steady dependable commander kind of what you see is what you get i think with jackson his ceiling might be higher than mm-hmm. what you might get with longstreet but also you have to deal with those underperformances the highs as and well. lows yeah so i think you know you kind of take it that, that i think jackson might be a more high ceiling his great moments are going to be great but you also have to deal with the other parts where i think longstreet gives you a much more steady hand which is why you know i've long said longstreet in my opinion is the finest corps commander in the American Civil War on either side. Yeah, and again, I know that's an assertion that has been made by biographers like Jeff Wirt, uh, which again, like when people say Jeff Wirt is a critic, I'm like, what? He, yeah. You know, I, I don't get it, or that sort of thing. I think when we say the best general or the most modern general, we really got to have some quantitative comparisons to make there. But, you know, and I don't know how often people actually make those comparisons, but certainly when you think of the Eastern Theater, I can't think of anybody who is going to compare in terms of a track record to Longstreet. Well, and that's something, too, that, you know, not to get beyond Gettysburg, right. he's got a track record for right. us here. From, right. And so we can really look at his performance in core command yep. as well. Most of his time has been, you know, he's not, he's a division commander for a while and then he gets core command. He's got a large body of work, which I think is why I feel pretty comfortable making that assessment. Yeah. The good news here is, you know, our free flowing conversation, we took frankly more time getting through 1862 than we thought we were going to, but you know, this is the kind of stuff we want to cover. We don't, we don't script the show. So I think Eric and I have kind of decided here, we're going to pause This episode at this point, as we bring James Longstreet into the momentous year of 1863, which we're going to cover in the next installment. Yeah, I think this is a natural point for us to kind of stop for now. I think this gives you some things to start thinking about. And 
One of the things that I think we take a lot of pride in is not just dealing with them here at Gettysburg, but giving you a sense of what they do on other battlefields and what helps shape the decisions they make here. And I think 1861, 1862 are critical moments in looking at the development of James Longstreet as a commander that we're going to see here ultimately on the battlefield at Gettysburg. Yeah, because we've already dealt with some stereotypes, offensive general versus defensive general. We have dealt with whether he can or can't sort of force General Lee, you know, into into his way of thinking. Uh, we've dealt with how he uses infantry and artillery together, all of which are going to be important when we get to July 2nd at Gettysburg, which ultimately is the intent of this multi-part series to get us through July 2nd. So, Jim, as we put a bow on this episode, once again, tell our listeners about tonight's sponsors. Yeah, as we put a bow on James the Hammer Longstreet, once again, we have been recording from Getty's Gear at 777 Baltimore Street in the old Gettysburg Village. Uh, Once again, you can call them at 717-334-3747 or email info at gettysgear.com. And they've got all of your Gettysburg needs, as they always say, history with a sense of style at Getty's Gear. And we also want to thank our brand new sponsor and member of the family, TR Historical. TR Historical, as we said at the beginning, is a family-owned small business from Easton, PA. They offer all kinds of swag for all all different periods in history. They do include the Civil War, but they're not limited to the Civil War. Check out their supply of Irish Brigade stuff, Lincoln, Grant, Patton, Siege Warfare card games, drinking glasses, magnets, stickers, all kinds of cool stuff at TR Historical. And you can visit them at trhistorical.com or you can email support at trhistorical.com. They've got free U.S. shipping, worldwide shipping available by request, and super fans save 10% with this code at checkout. Superfan. Use the Superfan checkout code to save 10% at TR Historical. So with that, we will see you next time as we cover the important period of Longstreet from the start of 1863 until he arrives in the battlefield here at Gettysburg on July 1st. So we're looking forward to that. A lot more to unpack as we delve into James Longstreet at Gettysburg. All right. Take care, folks, and see you next time on the Battle of Gettysburg podcast.